now take you to the broadcast of It's Time with Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. Here is Reverend Martin. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, never good night, and obviously never goodbye. Uh, my name is Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. I'm the pastor of the New Life Institutional Baptist Church here in uh, Los Angeles, California, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of It's Time. It's time for equity, it's time for social justice, economic and environmental justice. Hey, if they don't pay you, you got no business working for them. We take our business seriously, our uh, opportunity to speak a word on behalf of our brothers and sisters who may not feel that uh, they have an opportunity to speak for themselves. Uh, we take that quite seriously, and we hope that, that you will uh, likewise. Our marching orders come from uh, the Scripture, from many portions, but one or two of the portions that resonate with me uh, are found, one in the Old Testament, for you Old Testament scholars, and one in the New Testament, for you New Testament scholars that like things because they are new. In the Old Testament, God says, Thou shalt not oppress and hired servant that is poor and needy, whether they be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At their day, it means when they finish working, thou shalt give them their hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it. That means don't sleep on it overnight. The man or the woman needs to get to the stove that day. Uh, for they are poor and setteth their heart upon it. In other words, they made no doubt they're counting on that money. It may be the only money that they made that day coming from you. All right. Lest they cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. So you see right off the bat that if you don't pay somebody what you promise to pay them when it is due, God views it as oppression, and he views it as a sin. That's God talking. He doesn't say cheat. He says you are oppressing because when you oppress, you don't pay people their money that they are owed and that they have worked for or labored for or provided a good or a service on behalf of or for you that for which you are the beneficiary directly or indirectly, you, uh, God says that you are oppressing them because they have what? Uh, obligations. They have needs privately or publicly. Personally, it doesn't make any difference. If you owe them, you ought to pay them. Ain't your business what they do with their money. I wish I could get an amen on that one. And uh, the whole import of this section of Scripture is fairness, equity, and justice. Uh, I believe it was Cornel West says, justice is love in action. Hey, I think he got it from Rhino Niebuhr, but that's neither here nor there. The point is that we need to be fair and honest one with another because each of us at some time or another is in the position of getting somebody to do something for us, whether it's personal or whether it's uh, public is of no no moment. Uh, if we promise something, then we have to carry through uh, on what we have, have promised. There are very few exceptions to that uh, very good rule. I wish I could get a dry amen on that one. Now, our second scripture, as we said in the New Testament, is from the book of James, if I may. Uh, go down to that scripture. It's in James chapter 5 and verse number 4. And uh, this is what uh, that verse intones. It starts off by saying, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is, a, which is of you kept back by fraud. Mark that word, fraud. And then the word crieth, that means you didn't pay them, and they asked the Lord, they took it to God in prayer. 
And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have to be careful how you treat uh, people that are doing things for you. And this is whether the formal or the uh, informal uh, labor market, whether it's casual or otherwise. You have an obligation to be fair and just in your dealings with your brothers and your sisters. Isn't that right? And that uh, carries over in every aspect of human interaction. A lot of our interactions don't involve so much finances, but this speaks more specifically uh, to the economic uh, structure because we all live in a capitalistic system. We do not live in a social democratic system. And so uh, until that utopia is reached, which will not be in my lifetime or yours, uh, we have to at least have the wherewithal to continue to keep going. Uh, and that is why it is so important that we uh, look out for our brothers and our sisters and those that are indeed, uh, shall we say, economically challenged or money poor, as uh, most of us are. Because even the... Uh, those of us that are barely holding on to the middle class or so-called upper middle class, uh, we're struggling, isn't that right? Uh, we're having to uh, cut back or, or cut away or shorten uh, our vacations and uh, reduce our expenditures because as we look, if we are retired and we look down the road, we don't want to run out of money before we run out of life. Uh, as they say on that commercial. So that means we, we already are rationing our retirement. We are rationing our, our savings. We are doing our best to hold on. Some of us are getting uh, another job, another source of income to uh, help us to uh, keep going because the system under which uh, we live will grind you to powder and when you can't work no more, they will toss you up on the refuse heap of history. And you may not even be dead, but the world has no further use for you. And this is what uh, vexes God. And it, it's not pleasing uh, in God's sight. It's not even pleasing in my sight. And I'm so far beneath uh, God. Uh, but... When you read the scriptures and you've been taught uh, the scriptures and you taught justice from a child and then you see the inequities, you cannot help but uh, cry out and uh, speak out uh, against the, uh, the economic injustice and the social uh, injustice that is the daily fare of uh, most of us, the bulk of us, uh, I, I dare to say. Uh, I was on an airplane, uh, I, which I had paid for a seat to upgrade, and I sat down in my seat, which was the middle seat, and the lady that was sitting in the window seat said, I'm going to have to ask you to move so my husband can sit up here. The lady was white, quite naturally. And uh, I thought about that. I said, now that is simply another demonstration by the way, I was in Mississippi, <laughs> of white privilege manifesting uh, itself uh, even in uh, those uh, private uh, interactions that we have. Uh, needless to say, we had quite a row. But uh, the point is that uh, even today there is continued inequity and injustice uh, leading someone to say that you, you may not get everything you pay for, but you will pay for everything uh, that you get. And in our economic structure here uh, for salary and wages, uh, you look at U.S. governmental uh, statistics, and they are indeed uh, appalling. And I am very much troubled by what uh, one sees coming out in the Republican uh, budget for 2019. 
For instance, uh, they were planning to cut Social Security by $4 billion. The Republican Congress is planning to cut Social Security by $4 billion, with a B, dollars. Uh, if you will think back, uh, it was not many months or weeks ago that uh, the current president, current occupant of the White House, uh, Donald J. Trump, uh, gave a huge tax cut, a tax cut. He cut the taxes that the billionaires and the trillionaires, uh, the owners of corporations uh, and companies that trade on the U.S. stock exchange, the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ. He cut the taxes that they would have to pay in order to keep the United States going. In other words, because they have been so prolifically blessed in their businesses, their share of the tax burden is consequently and equilaterally what? Increased. Because you, they made more, so they have to what? Pay more. Uh, that includes people like Bank of America. Don't feel sorry for these big banks. All they are is thieves and robbers, and they don't want to pay their share of the taxes. But they get 100% of the share of security. They get the use of the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines and the military and the Secret Service and the and not to mention the police power of every state and municipality. And yet, when it comes to paying their share of the taxes to keep the country that they all wave the flag and say that they love, the United States of America, they are quite remiss in paying their share of the taxes. And they have a champion in Donald Trump, and quite frankly, they have a champion in the Congress of the United States of America which makes legislation and bills that become legislation that ease the tax burden of the banksters and the trillionaires uh, who have laid up wealth for generations of their families yet unborn. But what about the poor man's family? Well, if you cut the taxes that the top... Uh, people are supposed to pay, so they don't have to pay that tax. Then you have to make up that cut, that loss, somewhere else. If the rich people are not going to pay their share, then that means that the poor people, conversely, must pay more than their share. They must pay for the poor man's price, and they must pay for what the rich man is now exempted from paying. Consequently, when you hear that the budget for 2019 that is proposed by the Republican Party has within it these poison pills, uh, don't be uh, shocked or surprised. Remember, if you make a cut somewhere, you got to put that money back from somewhere else. And according to uh, what is coming down the pike, there is going to be a tax cut of some $537 billion. $537 billion. I'm looking at the facts, stats right here. Hmm? $537 billion in cuts to, guess it, Medicare. Huh? Medicare. Everybody needs health care. Medicare is one of the primary uh, sources or agencies, all of that legal terminology, uh, for providing health care to the bulk of Americans. Because very, poor, very few of us are rich. Most of us are poor. If you look in the Bible, the, only, the Bible doesn't talk about middle class. It only talks about rich and poor. Hey, I'm not rich. I must be poor. And so uh, most of us depend on uh, Medicare and Medicaid. But they're going to cut $537 billion from Medicare. And they're going to cut 
$1.5 trillion from Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is the federal state health care program that uh, benefits the poor. And what they plan to do is reduce the uh, per capita payment. In other words, what they pay for you when you go to the doctor or you need health care. They're going to cut that uh, proportionally per person. And they're, going in, and they're going to try to go to what they call a block grant program. That means a block of money will be given to each state for Medicare, and that's it. And if you know the history of the country, uh, you know that there's never been equity where there has been a pot of money put here for a purpose. The poor usually get the short shrift of that, and I'm speaking mildly. Because whether you're talking about uh, farmers or you're talking about aid to cities, the poor parts of the city have always come out on the short end of the stick. Los Angeles, California is no exception. You go back and look at how all of those areas out in the valley and uh, over there, little Tokyo and little Koreatown, how they built up under the administration of uh, Mayor Tom Bradley and uh, Gil Lindsay, the great ninth. And then you had Bob Farrell out here in the eighth where I live. And uh, then uh, you had those other uh, councilmen, politicians that were in office at that time. But you look south of the Santa Monica Freeway, you don't see all of that growth that you see back north of the Santa Monica Freeway, which means that monies that were earmarked for the entire city were finally uh, found their way north, but they didn't find their way south. So that when the 92 uh, riot occurred following the acquittal of the four officers that beat uh, Rodney King uh, so badly, and the city erupted, and everyone was surprised. Well, what's going on? Well, look at all those other years you've been neglecting the people out there. You know, and uh, that's uh, an aside, but uh, it makes the point that whenever there is a block, a pool of money, and a few people are controlling all of that money, the poor are going to receive short shrift. You can put that ticket to the bank and smoke it. Uh, you may have to go to court, yes, but you ain't going to get your money. You're going to be tied up in court for years. Uh, trying to say, well, in, in 2018, they were supposed to give us this, and they didn't give it to us, and here it is, 2025, and we still ain't got it. And that's, you know that's the way it goes. So uh, I don't hold out much hope for the Republican uh, uh, budget for 2019 as it is designed to impact the poor because, remember, the, federal, the uh, U.S. military is going to always be well-funded. And the National Security Agency is always going to be well-funded. Law enforcement is always going to be well-funded. And those uh, agencies have carte blanche, which means that if they got carte blanche, all the poor is going to get is an EBT card. Help me, somebody. And so when you look at these... Uh, uh, budget proposals that are right now in the Congress are being debated in the Congress of the United States of America. And you think back uh, to what God said about thou shalt not oppress the poor. And but yet you see the poor being oppressed in every way. Huh? And uh, our wages are cut. Uh, it is said that the largest employee in the United States of America right now is the big company called Walmart. But yet, if you work for Walmart, you still have to have supplemental nutritional assistance. You have to be in that program called SNAP. Now, I think the Republicans have changed the wording from SNAP to something else, but the point is the same. In order to work, make it at Walmart, you got to get SNAP. Well, the purpose of working is so you won't have to have no snap. But if you only, if you're working for Walmart, the wages that they pay are so depressed that you need to have be on 
supplemental income in order to make it. Now, how's a poor man going to make it like that? And it is, it is estimated uh, that 100 and well, over half of the working people who have retired don't have no savings. In other words, you worked all your life and you ain't got no savings. Hmm? And uh, that is atrocious. That, that is atrocious. That is inequity. That is criminal. And while I'm at it, remember that uh, Nikki Barber, who is one of the uh, high Trump officials, ambassadors, uh, recently, this week, as it were, withdrew the United States from the uh, United Nations Human Rights uh, Commission because they said that uh, they were biased against Israel. Now, the UN rapporteur issued a, issued a report in the month of May, month of May, critical of the way that the United States of America leaves so many of its own people in extreme poverty. It uses it, extreme poverty and uh, that and 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 uh, violation of human rights. Let me not get too relaxed here. Uh, let me talk about what it, what this rapporteur has said in brief. I won't get a chance to deal with, with it very much. But listen to what he said. In the United States of America, you have the highest rate of youth poverty. It means teenagers can't find no work and young adults can't find no jobs. Youth poverty. You have the highest rate of infant mortality. Not in Congo, not in Burundi, but in the United States. Hmm? This is what the UN rapporteur on the Commission on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights has uh, issued in his report. He also notes that in the United States, we have the highest incarceration rates of any developed country in the world. Think about that. The United States of America incarcerates over 2 million of its citizens in prisons and jails uh, right now across this country. It's been growing and growing exponentially. And the more they scream law and order, the more uh, they put people in prisons and in jail. Uh, and uh, while black people make up only 13% of the U.S. population, they make up 40%, 40% of the inmates in prisons and jails across uh, this country. That is an appalling statistic. Of out of the millions of people on the face of the earth, the United States incarcerates over 24.7% of the people in the world are incarcerated right here in the United States of America. Now, I kid you not. Also, the rapporteur says that there is a vast income inequality. You can say amen to that because you look at the difference between your check and the check of the uh, chairman of the board of Chrysler, chairman of the board of Goldman Sachs, there is no comparison. Hmm? When they talk about getting bonuses, they're talking in the millions of dollars. When you talk about a bonus, you might be talking about only $50. Amen. And so uh, the rapporteur says that uh, among all countries in the developed world, the United States is the worst. And uh, Nikki Haley, who is the uh, ambassador uh, for the United States, uh, took issue. Said you ought to be looking at Congo. You ought to be looking at Burundi. Or you ought to be looking at Iraq. You're looking at Iran. He said, no, we're looking at the United States of America, the richest country on the face of the earth. And that is how they're doing the bulk of the citizenry in the richest country on the face of the earth. Hmm? 40 million people in America living in poverty. All right. Says the policies pursued over the past year, that means one year, uh, seem deliberately designed. Note that word, deliberately 
designed to remove basic protection from the poorest. Huh? And it seems to punish those who are unemployed and make even basic health care a privilege. Even basic health care, which is to get your blood pressure and uh, get your uh, heart rate. And, but yet, uh, in this country, the richest country on the face of the earth, so many pe- millions of people are falling uh, through the gap on health, falling through the gap on the sa- on saving. Uh, folks have worked for years on their job, and when they retire or when they are forced to quit work, you can't work no more, you work from kin to can hmm? work from as long as long for as long as you can see to as long as you can work from kin to king. We're still doing that in the richest country on the face of the globe. And when you quit, uh, half the workers have no savings, no money saved up, no money. Only money you're going to get is Social Security and uh, disability. Huh? Yes. 140 million Americans right now struggling to meet basic living expenses that's food clothing and shelter that's basic that's what that's most of us are still praying thank you lord for waking me up this morning with some shoes on my feet roof over my head and give me something to eat that's we still at that same prayer you see whereas the rich are far beyond that basic prayer they ain't worried about no shelter they got three or four different houses those people that are losing their houses in uh, Hawaii, those are not native Hawaiians. <laughs> those are people that uh, pushed the, the native Hawaiians out and they built them houses. Now they're crying because the volcano come back and take the houses away, you know. But they got houses back here on the mainland. They ain't suffering. But the poor don't have no way else to go. Because that was, if they get lose their house, that's it, you see. Uh, but uh, so the, the, the gap, and the wealth between the rich and the poor is, is widening and it's getting worse and uh, worse. Uh, another uh, stat says that 12.7% of Americans are living in poverty. Mind you, this is the richest country on the face of the earth. Never mind about what they got over there in Arabia, uh, which is another story. But in the richest country on the face of the earth, where people are begging to get in here, and uh, and and the the uh, the uh, the plaque on the front of the Statue of Liberty that's out there in New York Harbor still says, "Give me your tired and your poor." That uh, twelve point seven million of Americans are still living in poverty, and you're getting blamed for that, isn't that right? And consequently. Uh, my brothers, as we wrap up and bring our show to a close, uh, we have to demand reparation. We have to demand a, a, a living wage. We have to uh, demand that if you're working, you got to get paid a wage that will allow you to put gas in your car and roof over your head, pay your rent, and put some food and shoes, put food in your stomach and shoes on your children's feet and allow you to have a chance at having a future. We're going to have to have a major labor uprising from the poorest of us uh, and the the old and the young because we're all being hurt and squeezed because those of us who may even have something, you're getting old, you get thrown in the rest home, you're going to take everything you got uh, in order to keep you in that rest home. And so we need to speak up, we need to fight, and we need to say something right now. Remember, you, you reach the point in life where you deserve and you de- need to get paid. Hey, they don't pay you, don't work for them. God bless you, may God keep you. It's our prayer. <laughs>